we are studying together the theme of covenant. Our purpose being to build up to an understanding of the new covenant that was made through the cross of Jesus. But the concept of covenant goes right back in the history of God's people and uh, I feel that many Christians just use the word covenant without any real appreciation of what's involved. So my purpose has been to go back to some of the original covenants of God, particularly the one he made with Abraham that we examined in some detail in Genesis 15. And I pointed out to you that those who want to be saints or holy ones or chassidim must have a covenant that's based on a sacrifice. That's the only relationship that God acknowledges permanently. In fact, in the Bible, every permanent relationship between persons has to be based on a covenant. There is no other basis for permanent relationships. One of the features of our contemporary scene is that there are very few permanent relationships. And the basic reason is because people are no longer willing to accept the commitment of a covenant. And without a covenant, you cannot have scriptural permanent relationships. Now, the covenant of God with Abraham in Genesis 15, we noticed, was based on the sacrifice of animals. Abraham was required to produce the sacrificial animals, kill them, cut them in pieces, and then in the person of the Holy Spirit, in the form of a burning lamp, the Lord passed between the pieces. I believe Abraham also passed between the pieces, and passing through the pieces of the covenant, of, of the sacrifice, they entered into a covenant with one another. Now that could be described as rather a primitive form of covenant, but the principle is very vivid, and that's why I chose to go there, that the only basis for a permanent relationship is a covenant. A covenant requires a sacrifice, and through the sacrifice, the parties that make the covenant enter into a totally new relationship with each other. However, the covenant that the Lord made with Abraham in Genesis 15 was in many ways incomplete. If you study it, it's very interesting, there's no provision made for Abraham himself in that covenant. The only provisions are for his descendants. Secondly, it is never called an everlasting covenant. And as I've stated, in my opinion, and there are people that would challenge this, that covenant was fulfilled when God brought Israel into the land of Canaan under Joshua. However, it was not the final covenant between God and Abraham. And so I want to go on now to Genesis 17 and look at the description of what was the final covenant. And as you're looking at it, I want you to be saying to yourself, but where's the sacrifice? Because it's a kind of biblical riddle. Where is the sacrifice? So we begin now Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, and we read through verse 8 to start with, which is the actual statement of the making of the covenant. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am Almighty God, in Hebrew, El Shaddai, the all-sufficient God. It's interesting that the Lord told Moses, he had never appeared to Abraham by the name Jehovah. If you check in, in Exodus chapter 3, we won't go there. The name by which he was actually visibly seen by Abraham was El Shaddai, the Almighty God, the All-Sufficient God. Alright, verse 2, I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Now notice, the first covenant was a covenant. This one, God calls my covenant. It's different. In Psalm 50, verse 5, the Lord said, Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made my covenant 
on the basis of a sacrifice. There's two streams in the Bible. There's a covenant and there's my covenant. Then Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him. I just want to say, never be ashamed to be on your face before God. A lot of wonderful men of God have been in that position before you. God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. Now here comes the name change that we looked at. Up to that time he was exalted father, Abram. Now he's going to become Avraham, father of a multitude. No longer shall your name be called Abraham, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. Notice God speaks in the perfect tense when nothing has changed visibly. As far as God's concerned, when he says it, it's there. There'd been no change in Abraham. He still didn't have a son of his own by Sarah. God said, I have made you father of many nations. Paul says in Romans chapter 4, God calls the things that are not as though they were. Once God has called a thing, that's what it is. You may not see the evidence, but that's the way it is. It's settled. Verse 8, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Notice now the first person mentioned in this covenant all the way through is Abraham himself and then his descendants after him. Notice also that there was a change of name. The, the first covenant didn't change his name. Now in the Bible, a change of name is always extremely significant. It indicates something that God has brought about in a person. And then notice, this is an everlasting covenant. I'll read verse 7 again. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Notice now the first emphasis is not on a land, it's on a relationship. I will be your God. Then we come to the land, verse 8. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now that, as far as I'm concerned, being a believer in the Bible, settles the question of to whom the land of Canaan belongs. It was settled 4,000 years ago. People can argue, the United Nations can vote, people can fight, but in the last resort, that's settled. Now that's the covenant. Rather interesting. Years back, in 1947, I was living in Jerusalem uh, and this was a time of tremendous tension. The Arabs and the Jews were fighting, there were snipers in the street, you never knew when a building would be blown up. Uh, I mean, everybody was living under tension. And I walked into a Jewish electrical supply store, I think it was on Ben Yehuda Street, I forget now. And I wanted to buy just some little appliance. And the man said to me, he said, terrible times were in. And being the kind of foolish person I was at the time, and I said, well, I have eternal life. <laughs> <laughs> so it really doesn't matter what happens to me what he said in our Bible there's nothing about eternal life <laughs> well by this time everybody in the store got interested in this strange person well I said to him what about what it says in Genesis 17 and I quoted to him in Hebrew I will give to you and to your descendants after you the whole land in which you are a stranger I said God says you give it to Abraham first and is to his descendants after him. Up till this time, Abraham has only had enough to be buried in. If there's no resurrection, that promise can never be fulfilled. Well, I tell you, there was a dead silence in that storm. <laughs> but I convinced myself if nobody else. You see. <laughs> All right, now, we've got the covenant. We haven't yet found the sacrifice, have we? 
No covenant is valid without the sacrifice. So we go on reading now from verse 9. God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and their descendants after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generation. He who is born in your house or bought with money from any stranger who is not your descendant. He who is born in your house and he is bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person should be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Now I pointed out to you that wherever you have a covenant, you have a sacrifice, and wherever you have a sacrifice, you have shedding of blood. Well, in this, you have the covenant, and you have the shedding of blood. Because you can't circumcise without the shedding of blood. But there's no sacrifice. But the blood of this covenant is taken from Abraham's own body and from his descendants. So God is saying, I believe, I'm going to provide a sacrifice out of your descendants. This is just a little indication of where the blood will come from. So now, we'll go on to the New Testament. And first of all, we'll turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Now this is in your outline. Some of what I've been telling you isn't in your outline but it's in in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 16 and 17. Now, one of the themes of Hebrews is covenant. We could perhaps read, well, we could read from verse 13, and then we get the context. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, these are just animal sacrifices, such as were offered under the law, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without God, and let me, I pointed out to you already, Jesus was both the priest and the sacrifice. He, the priest, offered himself as a pure, sinless sacrifice to God, through the eternal spirit. I just let me pause for a moment and point out that every significant transaction in God's plan of redemption involves the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The whole Godhead is involved. Um, The incarnation, God the Father incarnated the Son through the Holy Spirit. The baptism of Jesus. God the Father spoke to the Son, the Spirit descended upon him. The ministry of Jesus, Acts 10.38, says God, the Father, anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were sick. That always blesses me about the ministry of healing. Father, Son, and Spirit are in it. Then we come to the sacrifice. Jesus, the Son, offered himself to the Father through the Spirit. We come to the resurrection. God, the Father, raised the Son by the Holy Spirit. And we come to Pentecost, Jesus the Son received from the Father the Spirit and poured out on his disciples. It's like, if I could say this reverently, the three persons of the Godhead are all jealous not to be left out of redemption. So every major transaction of redemption involves the total Godhead, Father, Son, And spirit. So here we have in this verse, Jesus the Son offered himself to the Father through the Spirit. Going on reading that verse, how much more shall the blood of Christ purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant, diatheke. Remember that word? By means of death. You know, there's no covenant without a death, the laying down of a life. 
for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. All the people who had broken the law under the first covenant had no actual sufficient sacrifice until Jesus died. The sacrifices of the law covered sin temporarily. They never dealt with it. In fact, Hebrews says, in those sacrifices, a remembrance was made again of sin every year. I think the writer was thinking particularly of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, when the Jewish people believe that if they do the right thing, they have forgiveness for a year. But next Day of Atonement, they have to be back again claiming their forgiveness. They could never permanently deal with sin. Going on reading, in verse 15, For this reason he, Jesus, is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Notice the emphasis on eternal there. It's an eternal inheritance through the eternal spirit. Now, verse 16, you see, is a confusion for English-speaking people. For where there is a testament, but the Greek says, where there is a covenant. Same word, you understand? Where there is a covenant, let's put in the word covenant, there must also of necessity be the death of the one who makes the covenant. Now, when we use the word testament, we have no problem, because we are used to speaking about a last will and testament, and we know that testament is not valid until the person has died. But you see, there's a gap in our thinking, because when we think about a covenant, we don't see the same. But what the writer of Hebrews says is a covenant is not valid while the one who makes the covenant lives. Let me read that again in the next verse. For where there is a covenant, there must also of necessity be the death of the one who makes the covenant. For a covenant is in force after men are dead, since it has no power or it has no validity at all while the one who makes the covenant lives. You see? That's why there's no covenant without a sacrifice. When the Lord and Abraham walked between the pieces of those animals, each one of them said, that's where I lay down my life. You can't come into a covenant without laying down your life. I hope you can see the implications of this, because they're very far-reaching. See, we have a very superficial view of what the New Testament is, because we don't call it the New Covenant. But it is the New Covenant, and it's not valid while people live. <laughs> Those who are in covenant relationship must have passed through death. That'll... I can see some of you looking puzzled, but we'll, we'll work on that one. All right, now let's go to the place where Jesus initiated the new covenant. The seed of Abraham. Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 and following. Matthew 26, verse 26 and following. As they were eating, this is at the Last Supper, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it and gave it to, him, to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. Without anyone that didn't drink was not in the covenant. You understand? You had to drink to be in the covenant. Then he says, For this is my blood of the new covenant. Some translations leave out the word new, but that's unimportant. This is my blood of the covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So there is the establishment of the new covenant, and it's in the blood of Jesus. Um, we can take our finger out of Hebrews. Maybe you need to keep your finger in Matthew for a moment. I want you to turn to Genesis 14 for a moment. Genesis really is the book of Genesis. It's the genesis of every significant development. Genesis 14, verse 18. Now this is another incident in the life of Abraham. He had just defeated the kings who had destroyed Sodom and captured Lot. 
Lot, Abraham went after them because Lot was his nephew. So he was returning from the victory with all the spoil and a strange person met him. One of the most mysterious persons in the Bible whose name was Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a Hebrew word. Melech is king and Sedek is righteousness. His name means king of righteousness. It also says he was priest the Most High God. He combined the two offices of king and priest. All right, we read now verses 18 through 20. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he, Melchizedek, blessed him, Abraham, and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, Abraham, gave him Melchizedek, a tithe of all that he had. Now that's the first use in the Bible of the word priest. And notice, it was not a Levitical priest. Because under the law, the priesthood went to Levi, the kingship went to Judah, they were separated. But here's a man who combines kingship and priesthood. And he is so high in the things of the Spirit that he blesses Abraham. And the Bible says the less is blessed, the greater. But I want you to notice the exchange between Melchizedek and Abraham because it really has a lesson for us. First of all, Melchizedek gave Abraham something that Abraham had not given Melchizedek. Now that's never true of the Levitical priesthood. They only gave the people something that the people had already offered them. Second, in return, Abraham gave him a tenth or a tithe of all. What was the, the things that Melchizedek gave Abraham? Bread and wine. Now you see that was extremely significant because at the Last Supper, when Jesus brought out the bread and the wine and gave them to his disciples, he was saying, this is the priesthood of Melchizedek restored in me. And I think it's very interesting for us as God's new covenant people to see that the celebration of the bread and wine goes right back to the father of our faith, Abraham. It's not initiated under the law. It wasn't new in the New Testament. It goes back to Abraham. And something else goes back to Abraham, which is what? Tithing, that's right. That wasn't initiated in the law. It was continued in the law, but it started with Abraham. So, really in a way, you know, we, 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 we have some denominations that are very interested in their traditions and tracing them back, liturgical traditions. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not a member of a liturgical group. I, I appreciate liturgy, but I'm not one. But, praise God, I have a tradition that goes back 4,000 years. <laughs> when I take the bread and the wine, I'm saying by that, I'm a descendant of Abraham. And when I take the bread and the wine, if I give God my tithe, I'm also right in the Abrahamic tradition which goes all the way back there. 